She's the Department Head of Housing and Community Development Planner. And to my right is Carl Reinhardt, who's the Chair of the Human Rights Commission. And I'm City Councilor Mary on the Barge from Ward 6, and the Chair of Social Services and Veterans Affairs. And to my left is Councilor Eugene Tacey from Ward yeah. 7. And again. on the end, what you know, is Bill Dwight, our Council President and Council at Large. Hey, thank you for being here. Thank you. And I also want to announce that this meeting is being um, videoed and taped um, by the North Street Association. And Ruth, yes, and Ruth McGrath is doing it for him. Okay, great. Actually, um, first of all, we're going to preface it. We've been ending up most of our meetings with this, so with you know the bad news. So we'll preface it with the bad news that way we can all proceed. From it. But the uh, we have one hundred sixty-one thousand dollars worth of requests this year. Uh, less than half of that for uh, being awarded as a grant from the community development. The feds have it's it's down from close to ten thousand dollars last year, and when in fact we're not even sure this encompasses the cuts that might come from sequestration. So, that said, our tendency is to give it awards anyway, and the thing is that we want to encourage everyone to understand that our awards are not a reflection of our diminished esteem for the programs. And that, and, one, and I was thinking about this after yesterday, I was talking, uh, when we were talking about this stuff, and part of this is frustrating, is that if there's any way that actually as you, if, if you do, as most programs do, use the block grant funds as sort of a seal of approval and imprimatur from the community, if that could be reinforced with letters or endorsements or contacts through us, it's, it's trying to offset what it's going to be in all likelihood, not all that much, but it is, it is a representational portion of what it is that we're, we're giving out as awards this year, um, as pathetic as it is. I mean, it, I mean, I think we told you this last year. This, I mean, this sucks. This is a committee of suck. We yeah. sit here and we have to sit here and try and figure out all how we sustain all these really worthy programs with this paltry amount that gets smaller and smaller every year. Grover Northwest is succeeding in drowning the baby in the bathtub as he projected he would do with uh, particularly from what he called the federal program, but social service program, at least the feds contributions. So. That's all started, and then, and we all know, and we do, and that is, and I want to reinforce how much we we appreciate and recognize the good works that you guys do, and that, and how critical it is to to, to our community. So, and, and I just didn't want that to sound really hollow or in context of the of the, of the award. So, some more well, thank questions. Thank you, and thank you for all of your work making these possible given those diminished funds. I certainly appreciate that you all volunteer to do this. And I know that, you know, you come in every year to us and what I'm asking is that you could give us what your success has been and are there any problems? I think those are two big majors right here. Okay, absolutely. Um, the both if you don't mind, before I answer that question directly, I would just like to address what I hope folks are aware of, that we are applying this year for a different program area within youth programs. Um, and I want to also sort of clarify that that is not a reflection of our LGBTQ program um, ending or of significant challenges or lack of success within that program. Um, really, for us, it's been kind of, uh, if I can sort of be uh, blunt with this kind of a cost-benefit analysis of the specific data collection and the reporting that's required for Northampton CDBG being a harder fit for that program, making it challenging, um, and also that program serving a wide region as opposed to just Northampton youth. Um, and so wanting to focus our CDBG request onto a program that would be serving a larger number of Northampton-specific youth. Um, and within a context where it will be uh, much more doable for us to collect the required uh, demographic information to be able to supply that. So I just want to reiterate our appreciation of your long-term support of our LGBTQ programs and assure you that 
uh, those programs are continuing um, relying on our other funds and um, we'll continue to those. We actually have a so this is a new program. Um, this is a program that is new to Northampton. We have successfully piloted uh, in uh, 2012 an uh, expanded employment readiness services in our Franklin County. Um, Community Action Youth Programs has been doing employment readiness supports in, in Franklin County for a little over a decade uh, through a specific intensive federal program called the Workforce Investment Act. And we saw consistently through our work there a need for expanded services that could provide both individualized supports and more immediate supports without going while you've waited to go through the lengthy um, enrollment process or for folks for whom that long-term 12 to 18 month intensive program wasn't the right fit at this time. And so we piloted uh, with the support of the Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts an expanded employment readiness initiative up in Franklin County that provided individualized counseling, um, group education, workshop areas, um, college visits, support with higher education, um, skills assessments, and those types of supports. And we just saw such tremendous success. Um, in the world of youth work, you do a lot of kind of piloting new initiatives and trying new things and sort of trying different strategies to get at your angle. And this is one of those areas where we just saw immediate success within those first 12 months and such a demonstration of need that every school group we went to said, great, how else can you do even more here? And every, you know, so we had planned to serve 50 youth that first year and served about 160. Um, and so we're in the process now. We, uh, starting in January of 2013, we also have the Workforce Investment Act Intensive Employment Readiness Contract in Hampshire County, which we're very excited about. And so want to, or seeking CDBG support to be able to expand this other employment readiness initiative um, to serve Northampton youth as well, because we think it'll provide a really, um, a really effective support um, that we feel confident we can provide and also feel like it's a really good fit for the state level CDBG priorities. So that didn't quite get at your successes and challenges, which mm -hmm. I can. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. How many youths are you planning on Serving. We're planning on serving 75 Northampton youth through this through this program. And what's the age? Uh, ages 14 to 21. <laughs> I'm trying to make sense of your spreadsheet. You did Fifteen thousand dollars. I'm looking here. Twenty-five million. Oh, it's just uh, just. Um, Trying to put this all into perspective here. Um, Are you looking at the agency yeah. budget? Okay. So the best way that I can um, explain that is to describe Community Action is a, a large umbrella organization that serves Franklin County, Hampshire County, and the North Quabbin region, and now part of Western Hamden County. Yep. There are 400 staff serving over 30,000 um, low-income clients every year through a wide variety of benefits. And that, and that agency is broken up into nine departments that are pretty, that are each maintain their own funding and are really required to be self-sustaining. So out of those 400 staff that the agency has and the 30,000 clients that are served there as youth programs, which is our, our department that provides positive youth development programming, we have a staff of nine that includes staff and AmeriCorps members um, and a obviously a much smaller annual operating budget. So when you look at um, when you look at this, this is showing our whole agency budget. Um, I think more relevant to, or I don't want to say more relevant, but perhaps more helpful at getting yes. at this particular question, mm -hmm. the budget on right page 10 shows the cost of this particular program yeah. um, within the context. So keeping in mind that agency budget includes, I believe, 38 early childhood classrooms that run year-round, fuel assistance for elderly people, et cetera. So a lot of folks, a lot of aspects of the agency's work that aren't directly related to this program. It was just confusing as to why it was even there. We asked for both. Oh, you did? We asked for an overall agency and the program specific, just okay. so we can get the whole picture. Because okay. well, after I had gone through this and then I get to the back pages, it was overwhelming. It was trying to, trying to figure out where to put fifteen thousand dollars into this twenty-five million. And why are you here? <laughs> but I get it. I mean, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Absolutely. 
we're, we're familiar with the DVD. Yes. <laughs> don't hold it against us. No, 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 no. We know you're a usability manager by you. Yeah. So. Are these like at risk youths? How about disabilities? Absolutely. Um, we really target serving young people who are at risk and who have disabilities. And that can be range from young people who have been identified through an IEP process as having you know, mild learning disabilities to young people who have some more severe and profound ongoing issues that uh, affect their educational and occupational goals. So um, you know, we, through our Employment Readiness Support Program, we really feel fortunate that we're able to really diversify our, the supports that we're providing and um, able to target different groups of young people. But because through our Workforce Investment Act funding, it, there's very specific criteria for enrollment and young people have to do very specific things in order to reach outcomes and with this flexible funding we're able to reach a lot of different types of young people. Um, we were really happy up in Greenfield to be able to um, have our employment readiness specialist provide services to a life skills class at Greenfield High School and be able to talk about some basic, um, really important employment readiness skills, Another, but nonetheless we were able to break those down into something that was manageable and understandable for that group of young people, which was really empowering for that group of young people as well as for our employment readiness specialist who was so pleased to be able to you know, serve the diverse array of young people that were at that high school. And where's your office located right now? This program area? Uh, we have, we're really excited. We have a new site in Northampton at 17 New South Street, the building where the Center for the Arts is. So we are on the ground level there. Um, we're co-located with two other community action programs, with the community resources and advocacy and with the fuel assistance, sorry, three, and housing services. And so that's another nice overlap. It's been great for us to be there. Um, those can be services that can be daunting for you to access. Um, and uh, so to be able to have that presence where they're meeting the staff that they're then talking to on the phone and it's right in the same space has really facilitated those connections. So we have a site on 17 New South Street, it's, you know, 100 feet from the bus stop, wheelchair accessible, so that's been really great. And this specialist is also able to work directly at other community-based sites, including at the schools. So that's something um, that we've gotten great feedback from working with other schools is the need for these additional supports to come in, that guidance counselors just have really large caseloads of youth and aren't able to provide these auxiliary supports but they've been able to very effectively identify youth that they fear are at risk of dropping out or for whom really not sure how they're gonna kind of make that, make that leap from point A to point B, of completing high school or leaving high school, and on to that next step, that transition either to post-secondary education or employment or if they're leaving without a degree into a GED program. Um, and so we've been able to work with them to target those youth and then provide services sometimes still within the school building um, and leaving, and then also actually then bring them kind of onto our site to have that seamless transition. And Jenny has already been meeting with staff at Northampton High School in Smith Folk. Yeah. Um, and has gotten really welcome response. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah. On the career pathways. Yeah. Yes. Is that, is that something that uh, these youths, that, that, these are 14 to 24, you said? 14 to 21. To 21. Is this something that they have in their head, or is it something that you're helping them develop? Is this something that you that you put into their head, or is it something that they want to do? Or? It's a little bit of both. I think we have some young people who have really strong ideas about what they want to do with their future, and our role is to really just help them explore those options and be able to get a realistic picture of what does it really mean to be an engineer and what are the you know, educational pieces you have to put in place and you know, what, are, what is the work experience you're going to have to have in order to attain that goal. But we have, I, I would say a large majority of our young people have a general sense that they like to work with their hands or they like to work with people, but they don't know what that means. And a really important part of our career pathways is being able to have 
data and be very closely associated with the Franklin Hampshire Career Center and being able to know what some of the, the career pathways that have a great deal of employment options in this area are available to young people and expose them to those opportunities and be able to give some education around that and then be able to say in the future these are some of the areas that will have employment options so let's take a look at this and see if this would be a good fit and that's really helpful for young people because it makes it, it more tangible versus oh I want to work with people I like working with older folks sorry about that that's okay, <laughs> okay. Um, to So to, I really like working with older folks and I'd like to work in a nursing home but maybe not do CNA work because you know doing kind of that really hands-on work is a little bit too hands-on for me but I'd rather do be like a rec assistant or work within the rec department and you know help provide enrichment activities for older folks. So it's about exploring options and being able to put names to things versus having some of the stuff that's not quite maybe as solid for young people. As an employer, I ask because I have a lot of as that want to come to the city, they want to pound nails, and uh, they don't want to retake, you know, and they don't want to be outside if it's going to rain. Or, right. Um, so anyway, you, so you explain to them just exactly what it entails Absolutely. and what they're looking for. Yeah, and give them some hands-on experience to do it. I mean, yeah. if we have a young person who says, oh, I really want to be a carpenter, then you know, we look for an opportunity to be able to partner with an uh, employer to be able to say, can you maybe have a job shadow for a young person or can you maybe talk a little bit about what your job actually entails so a young person gets a better idea of what, what it actually means. Thank you. I'd like, to, uh, I, I'd like to acknowledge that we haven't even gotten your name. Sure, I'm sorry, I'm Jenny davis Boko. I'm the Assistant Director at Youth Programs. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And I'm, I'm intrigued with what kind of, it sounds like you, primarily get the young people from the schools. Is that right? Or are you dealing no. with homeless or street people? And how Absolutely. are you getting those connections made? And how are you working with guidance counselors? So I think our the population that we work with is very diverse. We certainly work with in-school youth. We get lots of referrals from guidance counselors. We develop relationships with schools. Um, our WEA program has young people that are in school and high school. So you know, through our employment readiness programs, we're able to develop those relationships, establish the supports that we're able to provide, and lots of referrals come to gui um, from guidance counselors that way. Uh, but being that Community Action is an anti-poverty agency and connected with a lot of different collaborators in the community who work with, you know, all different sorts of people who have different challenges in their backgrounds, we get a lot of referrals from folks that know that we work with young people and hope that, you know, if there's a young person who's homeless, but you know, we're able to help them with connecting them with community resources and advocacy, of, you know, regarding to get some housing stabilization. And then we at youth programs can help them with the employment readiness part. So, you know, we, I think it, it, it's so diverse. I can't, I can't really be able to, um, you know, put numbers to exactly who we serve, but we certainly see young people from being homeless to having disabilities to, you know, just simply being disconnected and not knowing what they're going to do next and, you know, just need a little bit of support and guidance to be able to, to make next, you so know. So it's often referrals from other parts of your agency who are picking up these concerns. Absolutely. As well as other community-based partners um, <coughs> and also a really strong peer referral word of mouth yeah. um, record, which I think uh, we take also as a strong sign of success when you start telling their friends, hey, these are good people, they really helped me. Um, particularly when we're dealing with youth that are more disconnected or sometimes mistrusting of, you know, walking into a new new establishment and asking for support, having that peer referral can make a really big difference as well. And we certainly see a lot of word of mouth uh, referrals to this program in particular. What about like your home environment? Do you find out that sometimes there is a problem there which escalates where this youth could have this problem on the outside? because you can't vamp or let anybody know or her that there's a problem at home? We certainly develop relationships with youth, and a lot of time during that um, during that relationship building process, they'll disclose challenges that are at home. So, I mean, we certainly have lots of referral sources in the community to be able to provide mental health supports, or you know, I mean, access DCF services in order to provide some stabilization. So, I mean, certainly some of our young people have pretty challenging living situations, and we we try to support them with the, the services that we have and girls. Thank you. Do you guys represent the 
cohort that is tends to fall between the cracks in, in coverage. It's the uh, you know up up to fourteen. There's plenty. There's plenty of agencies and, and, and coverage, and then twenty one and older. But you you guys have the gap group that you're covering here, uh, and I think the added bonus you alluded to it and Carol was referring to it is though the fact that you come that you are part of a larger agency that actually provides services that are that go beyond the scope of what you would describe but it allows you for referrals it also gets it gets you contact points where others might not have access to them. so you can get partnership referral you can get interagency referrals and then consequently you can also given the circumstances and, and, and the challenges you can make referrals there, so it seems there's a good symbiotic relationship. Absolutely, and I think one of um, one of the ways, one of my goals for all of the youth that we work with is that they develop the skills and tools and resources. All hands to the day room. All hands to the day room. Um, that they develop skills and resources to be able to identify their goal. Five, three, five, 39 Golden Drive in Florence, looking for a flooding basement. Engine, engine 5, Refive 39, Golden Drive in Florence for a flooding basement. Just, just be grateful we're not in the day. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, to identify their goals and the steps that they're taking towards those goals and have enough skills and resources and connections that they're able to continue to work through those as other barriers crop up. And that that's one of the things that we really see with young folks is they might have a good sense of a goal and some steps to get there, but then their housing situation becomes less stable and that becomes the sole focus and it completely derails them or there's a relational issue that really derails them. And so trying to create a space that can kind of hold that vision and some of those steps for where they're going, that they develop those skills to say, okay, there are crises, there are things that come up, we all have barriers that we navigate in our lives. How do you get support? What do you need? What are the resources available to deal with this and deal with this while still also maintaining a track towards where you're going? Um, and I think that's one of the areas that flexible supports like this can really be beneficial because it can provide that information and referral and then, okay, so if you're maybe doing a little bit less towards your goal of the DD this week or towards this job, but can you do one thing on that list so that you're continuing to move forward and have that, um, that they know that they're continuing to make progress. You might have said this and I might have missed him. Bilingual staffing? We do, yes. Spanish and English. Okay. And just percentage of English speaking and Latino speaking, yeah. Is it a of even staff mix? or our participants? Of oh, participants. Um, within our WIA program and, and the folks that we're seeing in um, in Hampshire County, I would say it's about 50-50 at this point. We mm. have certainly had an increase um, since providing services down here in seeing a, a greater diversity of young people, including young people who speak Spanish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So what I'm seeing is that you're requesting $15,000, and you know that, which Councilor Bill Dwight just talked about, what would actually happen now if we're not able to grant you that 15000 If we're able to give you something, I'm not going to say what that something is going to be, but would you have to decrease the amount of youths here in the city that you would have to take care of? Would it hurt that program where you would have to say, well, I'm not going to do the 75, we're going to have to decrease that number? Yes, I think that um, with this program in particular, there's a pretty, a pr not exactly linear, but a somewhat linear relationship between our staffing hours for the program and the number of youth that can be served. Um, and so that is what we would look at. And you know, similarly, kind of without a number and looking at more detail at the budget, I can't you know give you an exact percentage of how that would factor. But it, we would look at a decreased number of staff hours focused on Northampton and therefore a decreased number of Northampton youth being being served. Um, we certainly are very conscientious about leveraging resources and I think are pretty creative in terms of <laughs> linking things together and having staff serve multiple roles in any way possible that we can kind of increase that efficiency and, and connection, but there certainly comes 
the point where they don't have the time they can. <laughs> so you can't do the work. So it's going to be existing staff and new staff. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. It and seems as though you've really cut the mustard out of the time, too. Yeah. I mean, I know. So you can't even do it in a week, it's in a month. Yeah. Five hours a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to wrap up. That's it. We need to wrap I want up. To thank you, Jerry. Very I mean, much. did you have any final questions? Thank you, Sarah. Anybody have any final questions? Go on, fine, thank you. Carol? My question was a may take too much time. I was wishing you would give me a case study, an example of somebody who's gone through this program and how long it's taken for them to achieve your definition of success. Um, but that may be that may be a long story. And then yeah, I, I think don't you know, make it too long. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can generalize it and say okay. with our young people, we really um, try to take and make success to something that's small and achievable to be able to build up to bigger successes. So if a young person shows up and they put together a resume and we do a job search, they walk away from youth programs feeling like that was successful. So, so 80% of all of the people, of all the kids achieve at least one of the goals, educational or, or employment. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. And my apologies again for our delayed arrival. So oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Don't get left. <laughs> I think that's unavoidable at this point. I know. to this guy with a camera. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to be here. Been here before. Yes. And, um, you know, Pat Keller. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go through mine. How about, you know, Carol? Yes. Yeah. Right? 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 For the Rights Commission. Sure. Jennifer Derringer. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the first time you've met Jennifer? No, I think you were here last. At the last year. Yep. First mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Yeah. That was right. first time. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. 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 <laughs> Hi. and... Hi. Yes, oh yes. Bill Dwight, fair, fair, not so president. Okay. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you. Okay, since you were here last year, because we know about the program, yeah. can you let us know what success you had with this program and are there any problems? Sure. Um, yeah, as you as you stated, this is this is our second year applying. Last year was the first year that you funded us, which was terrific. Um, so it's been incredibly successful. I mean, I had every expectation that it would be, and um, we had our deliverables were to help ten households with either eviction defenses or um, helping them get public housing or helping them keep their Section Eight vouchers. We have at the midway point when we submitted our midway or our second quarter report, we had already helped 18 households. Um, so we're well beyond the mark. And I just want to let you know mm -hmm. this meeting, I'm sorry, is mm -hmm. being videoed, okay, okay, by North Street Association. Yeah, 
I'm the only used of doing it a one shot deal. Now we've got people coming <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Sorry. 18, halfway through, you're yes. going to have to speaks very well for your agency, not particularly well for the Times. Correct, yes. There's no lack of cases. I mean, we had come, we had originally asked, and we're asking again for 15,000 so we can do more, and we recognize that's, that we know what the numbers are, we know how, how tough it is. Um, and you awarded us 2,600 last year, so any, you know, any increase would be terrific, but right, I mean, the need is there. Um, we can always do more. 7,500 or something? 15,000. 15, yeah. Here's the breakdown: um, one hundred sixty-one thousand mm -hmm. requests, uh, $161,000 dollars worth of requests. Mm -hmm. Less than half of that available for the. For the we actually got we're, we had eighty-eight thousand dollars to award last year. This year we have seventy-nine, mm -hmm. and that's um, with the anticipated cuts, but possibly not the anticipated cuts of sequestration. Right. So mm -hmm. there may even be less than that. Right. So the, the, the the although we have less applicants. Mm -hmm. um, Probably the award dispersal is going to be roughly the same, and, and consequently, mm -hmm. level funding is optimistic. And just I mean, that's the heads up. And the thing yeah. is that what I'm trying to say to everyone, and, and I think I speak for everyone here, is that what's so frustrating about this is, is the the award in no way reflects the level of mm -hmm. of of respect, respect, mm -hmm. and esteem that we have for the programs. And in fact, nor does it reflect our sense of how much we need these agencies and programs and then we we are uh, perennially embarrassed by the the kind of very low awards that we we give out Councilor Tacey pointed out over the last four years right four years 30 percent uh, three years three years 40 percent reduction from uh, original block rent. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking what I was offering was that if, if even letters of endorsement from this committee, um, if you're using the, these monies as well as an application for, for leveraging other grants and things like that, I, I think that there are some committee members who would be willing to uh, submit a letter uh, of some sort that would, that would represent our, our desire to see your agency and other agencies here funded. That's good to hear. Yeah, and I, I recognize how difficult the decisions are. And really, we were grateful to be funded at all. And that was <coughs> last year was the first time we had ever applied. So we felt extremely fortunate yeah, yeah. to get what we got. And what you talked about is really true. We have been able to leverage this funding. We've cobbled it together with some funding we got from a DHCD grant, which came down from HUD, so that we were able to hire a person. Um, I mean, it's a temporary position, but she's full time to do housing work, which is phenomenal um, and really that's it's the leveraging of the grants and the cobbling them together that makes things like that possible so um, even though it's small it's <coughs> being placed in a position that is terrible you know because all the agencies for years that I've been doing it you also have a counselor and you counselor now for the past couple of years it's like they keep taking and taking and when we have new ones that come in and we look at them and say, oh, we just would love to go ahead and give them what we have. And we can't do that. Yeah. You know, it, they put us in a very bad predicament. Yeah. And it's they, less they again. Yes. Right. Right. No. Not the agencies so that are guys. applying, just, so, just to be clear. That's, oh. Right. Yeah, this is my third year doing it. The three years are the biggest right. cuts. I, you know, coincidence? You know, for, for years before that, you know, went down 10%. And, right. and, and we're all of not sudden, talking about the agencies. We're talking about what we're being given for CDBG money. Yeah. You know, and it's like, why are they doing this to us? It's pretty difficult. Well, it we, is. And we, got, we actually all know why this is. This is actually a, a cultural has worked for years. There, was, there are groups who worked very hard for years to suggest that any kind of funding for social service program in particular is this kind of vestige of the New Deal and there's different attitudes about this. And, and it runs counterpoint to the fact that there's no end of bankers who <laughs> increased their income on our, on, with us paying their welfare. So, in, 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 my rant. 
So, are you guys going to ask her about her program? We actually discussed uh, your program a little bit yesterday when, uh, here, in when Council Lamarge and I were really steadfast on on uh, food and shelter. Mm -hmm. We were actually persuaded by Carol yes, Reinhardt, exactly. and it turned out to be when you came before our social services that what in fact was happening was that you were actually part of this shelter, keeping people sheltered. So anyway, so we were more than happy that, uh, that it worked out, and, um, and you seem to have had great success with this, and we have. We're extremely happy. Yeah. And, uh, Carol, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> how, many, how many total people did you end up serving? So we've served 18 so far, 18 households, um, and I have every reason to expect that will double with the second portion of the grant, so that'll be 36. And we have had, um, of that, of the 18 households, um, there were, we maintained tenancies in all of the eviction defense cases except for one, and we brokered a move-out agreement in that one, so they had a, a soft landing. Um, we were able to maintain two Section 8 vouchers for the two families that we worked on the Section 8 cases, and we were able to get one, uh, one survivor of domestic violence into public housing. So we were successful in al almost all of the cases, and the one that we weren't, we were able to you know, give the, the family enough time to find a new place to move. So and Carol's right, this really is homelessness prevention. Um, and it, you know, the, the upheaval, we work with homeless families as well, up in the, you know, in the shelters, up in the motel, in Greenfield, and the upheaval on, on people's lives to be homeless like that, especially for the children, is you know, if you can avoid that by preventing the eviction, um, you know, the impact on the family is, is just tremendous. Um, and what we find with these cases is they're solvable. Um, you know, there needs to be there needs to be an advocate for the tenant because they're often unable to do it themselves. But they're they're clearly solvable because we're we're doing it, um, and we work so well and so collaboratively with the other agencies that also do this work: community action, who gives the rent arrearage, um, tenancy preservation, who helps mentally ill folks. We apologize for that. That's I, I recognize that. Yeah. I have to say, my three-year-old is going to be so jealous that I am sitting here right now in the fire department. If you were where? So, Jen, what we're looking at is on the CDBG funding. Yeah. That this project is going to provide 300 hours of attorney time, right, at fifty dollars per hour. And then, what is the rest? which will benefit approximately 20 unduplicated Northampton residents faced with a loss of affordable Right, housing. that's the application for the full $15,000. Oh, okay. Yep, right. yep. And we have honestly provided more out, we're providing more hours than that. Um, Respond 38 calls Realistically. Um, and what I, I supervise the um, attorneys who are on the grant, um, so it's my time on their time as well. And what we do is we're in court, in housing court, in, on eviction day every Monday when the court's in session, and we pick up cases that way. We also get referrals from other agencies, from mental health uh, professionals. Um, Cooley Dickinson just referred a case to us. They had somebody up in the, um, in the, on the site unit. Yeah. So we get our, our um, referrals from everywhere. Um, and the one thing I wanted to say as I was thinking about this, it's not just the impact on the individual households that we've had, but um, there are two other, <coughs> at least two other issues that we've been able to tackle because we've been able to identify it and, and you know, sort of leverage this money <coughs> to do more impact work. The, the first is identifying this issue of a lot of families needing rent payees to help them pay rent because uh -huh. they have some kind of disability that prevents them from being able to do that kind of thing. And so we're starting to think about this issue of, the, the reality is there are no rent payees in this area. Um, there's really, I think there's only one that I know of in the entire state. So we're starting to think about how can we leverage some money to help an agency apply to do that kind of thing to help folks so they're not at the point of eviction. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is we've been working with the Northampton Housing Authority more because we're taking more of these cases, and we've started to identify, um, they have an administrative plan that governor, governs their Section 8 program, and every couple of years they have a public hearing and they take comments on how to make the plan better. And because we've been working on so many of these cases, we've started to identify ways of improving the plan. So we're going to submit comments. I was on the phone with John Hyde the other day, you know, so we're giving him the heads up that we're going to submit comments for suggestions to make the plan better. Um, so that's going to have a far-reaching effect on all of all Northampton residents that are dealing with the housing authority. So that feels really good too. You, you deal with conservators at all, like that? Not in the housing context. Some in the elder, we do elder work. Yeah. So some of our elder attorneys do. Okay. So you don't. Okay. 
some pretty big piece of the population too. Sometimes we'll deal, we had not in Northampton, but up in Franklin County, we had a client who was deemed incompetent, he had a guardian, and so yeah. we worked with the guardian on the housing case, and we were actually able to, to save that, we worked with DMH was involved, ServiceNest was involved, it's one of those examples of nice collaboration that happens in the Valley, which yeah. is so nice. Okay. Yeah. And we worked with a few, a few in Florence, so I just kind of, mm -hmm. I just kind of hear some stuff, right? mm -hmm. but, you know, but it's not a lot in Northampton. No, we don't see it much. Okay. So what's the language um, breakdown in terms of English, Spanish speaking? Oh, um, let's you see. May have that here. I, I have see. the quarterly report. Um, let's see. The racial data was um, six white families, two uh, African American families. Um, <coughs> oh, this is just for the second. That's just for the first quarter. Sorry. <coughs> Um, 11 white families, three African American families is the, is the total that I'm seeing for the two quarters. Um, and then one other, um, I think, significant um, statistic is that 10 of the households were, had disabled family members, um, which we, we see a lot of. Um, I, often the disability is somehow connected to the reason for the eviction. Um, so that, that's been a pretty significant um, number that we've seen. Um, but I think that rate, you know, Language-wise and, and race-wise, we're tracking the, the general population of Northampton, it seems. Um, yeah, every once in a while, we have a Spanish-speaking client. I speak Spanish. Um, our secretary is, I'm not fluent. Um, our secretary is, and so we have, um, we work with, with, the, with her um, to interpret, and then the court provides interpreters when we're in court, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so there's no language issues. So, so among your partnership referrals, like Casa Latina? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I noticed you've listed several sources of funds, but other is the only that's giving money at the moment from the uh, Mass Bar Association. I'm looking at page seven. Okay. And I'm just intrigued with how you, you know, I understand you leverage funds and make jobs with cobbling uh -huh. things together, but can you give me some idea of the are these places you've applied at the moment and don't have I'm so, I don't funds? think I actually have. Are you looking at the application? Yeah. I mean, so you've got, got yeah, emergency shelter grants, home, mm -hmm. hope wife, mm -hmm. other federal funds like state housing, community development. Mm -hmm. So you want to know what so I'm just getting. curious about where your other sources are and what that how that goes. Sure. For, for the housing specifically. Right. Yeah. So the, the, um, there's an ESG grant, um, Community Action is the lead on that, and we're a subgrantee under that. That's the DHCD money I was talking about, but this gets really confusing, comes from HUD. Um, and that's what we cobbled that together with this to allow us to hire somebody for the year. Um, we do eviction defense under that grant, but that covers Franklin County, Hampshire County, and all of Hampton except for Springfield, um, just because that's the catchment area, not mm -hmm. our choice. Um, and then the other, the MBF, is the other pot of money, and what the, what the Mass Bar Foundation funds is our um, Lawyer for the Day program. It's called Housing Court Intervention Program, which has the unfortunate acronym of HICCUP. Um, but that is, that, is the pro, that is part of why we're in court every Monday, picking up cases. That's... Um, sort of an emergency model and it's designed to catch people at the bottom of the safety net folks that have not been referred to us some other way and are finding themselves in court on eviction day talking to us for the very first time. Um, so the way it works in practice, you know, our Northampton office covers uh, Franklin and Hampshire County and it's a relatively small office um, and we have our um, Chantal who um, is an African-American uh, newer attorney. She's been out about three years. She's the attorney on this grant. We have an AmeriCorps attorney, which is also really nice, another nice leveraging of, of federal funds, which hopefully we'll get to keep. And then I supervise them both. And so we are all, we all work together um, on, the, on the cases and we're the ones that are, are in court on Mondays, and that's sort of how we work collaboratively. Does that, I'm mm -hmm. hoping that answers your question. Okay. And you find it to be smooth. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's great. The three of us work really well yeah. together, um, and it's really nice to be able to, I mean, I don't, I, I mostly supervise and not case handle, so it's really helpful to have them both to sort of figure out where different cases should go, and they're amazing, really fantastic. Good. Yeah. You did a great job. Thank you.
I know, and I think you're going to continuously see an increase, continuously. Well, that's the sad thing, right? Yeah. The money, as, yeah. as the money gets, the pocket smaller, the need grows. It's, yeah. it's inversely hmm. proportionate. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much for being here, Jen. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thank here. you for what you do. My yes. pleasure. Absolutely. Anything else I can answer? We'll try to do our best. Okay. I don't know. I know. I, I do not envy you your jobs. So seriously. Um, thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice holiday coming up. Thank you. You too. Uh, Mike, we're going to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> now they're going to be beating right the drums in our public comment now. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh, oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I have nothing to do with any of these things other than helping things regurgitate through the system. Uh, I'm a peristolic motion. If it, yeah, that's the it. Yeah, the, I'm the, yeah. No, I don't think peristolic motion is better. I'm, <laughs> I'm peristalsis. And will you be marching in the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade? I will be, yes. Excellent. I'm actually, I'm thinking of taking Gus, and I'm, is that crazy to take a three-year-old? No, I grew up watching that parade. There are better places to watch it than others. Maybe uh, miss, for Gu with guys. Gus, I would, I would, uh, you know, by the high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Which is actually where the TVs are, though. So, well, mm -hmm. sometimes they change from year to year, but that's. Yeah. But the high school, <laughs> the beginning of the parade's a little hairy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, downtown's pretty cool. Uh -huh. High street's pretty cool. Uh huh. Um, I love it coming around my Yankee peddler. Mm -hmm. It's just there's no sun down on High Street. Right. 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 Great sausage yeah. grinder stand yeah. at the at the Round Church there. That's right. Yeah, that's where my brother hangs out with his yeah. kids. I mean, hot dogs. That's all you need for three year olds. It's much more family friendly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, guys. Sorry. Hi, Carl. Again. Hi, everyone. I see you again and again. Yeah. Bob Jeffway says hi. Good, great. <laughs> Welcome, Carl. Thank you. And you know Peg Keller. Oh, of course. Yes, and to my right is Carol Reinhardt from the Human um, Rights Commission, City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6, and Councilor Bill Dwight and Councilor at Large. On the end is Bill Dwight <laughs> and Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7. Got it. Got it? Okay. And I also want to let you know that this meeting and this hearing is being videoed and taped by the North Street Association and Luke is doing it. Why? <laughs> Has anybody asked that? Uh, no one has asked that. That's a good question. No. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to answer it. I, it's, we there have are some people out it. there who will watch this. There yeah, are okay. some people who will watch it. I asked why when you first set up. Yesterday. Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> so, so. The My boss said boards, come. Uh, for, for no, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. 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 So how's everything going? Well, thanks. Good. Yeah. Well, Carl, I think what we'll talk about is because you do come every year, why don't you tell us about the success of your program and are there any problems? The program's uh, going well. And uh, last month we celebrated uh, 27 years of operation. And I've been with the program for 22 of those 27. I, I, left, I left them run it without me for the first five years Yay. to get it off the ground. Yeah, let them yeah. I came in. And, <laughs> and wow. uh, the story is about the same as uh, it was when I was here a year ago. Uh, we're, uh, we're doing well. and. Uh, we have a strong board of 10 people and a good staff and plenty of volunteers. Volunteerism has really caught on in Northampton, in case you haven't noticed. I mean, all the organizations get more offers of volunteers than they can use, actually. It's because the colleges and even the high school are emphasizing it. So anyhow, uh, uh, we're doing the same old thing, continuing to provide Three free meals a week, every week, 52 weeks a year, and, and then a special uh, community meal on Thanksgiving and Christmas. And the last couple of years, we've really gotten into 
delivering meals on those two holidays to shut-ins, like the Yarnacourt used to do. And uh, uh, the Monday meal at noon is in uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, and uh, a Wednesday evening meal and a Saturday noon meal are in Edwards Church. That's the same as it's been for, for a long time. What are the ones at the Edwards Church? Uh, uh, Wednesday night at 6 and Saturday morning at 11.30. And, you know, attendance and you know, meal count varies all over the place, but I think a good average is about 40 guests at each meal, and we provide 90 meals. And the meal count is so much higher than the guest count because if, if anybody has seconds, which a lot of them like to do, they have to take a clean plate, and that counts as another meal. That's a requirement from the food bank, where we get most of our food. And then the takeouts are really popular, and we don't care how many they take as long as we have enough food with three hours, it seems. And, and, and the homeless and the SROs, they, they'll take two or three, whatever they can safely keep until they can eat them. And uh, if you do the math, uh, that ends up about uh, 14,000 regular meals and 1,000 at each holiday meal for a total of 16,000. And if you notice our budget, we're providing 16,000 meals on a budget of $26,000, which comes out to about $1.60 per meal, which is, I think, amazing. Yes. But, but it's obviously because the two churches don't charge us rent, which is the biggest part of a charitable organization, renting a facility they do that thing in. And, uh, oh, just one more thing. Uh, because of the need to, I guess, and because we picked up a strong a board member who's strong in fundraising, we've really upgraded our fundraising, and, uh, which is uh, good for us and good for the program. And uh, we're, we've, we're establishing a, a good-sized database for our annual appeal letter, and then in the near future, we're, there's going to be a comedy night at uh, the Unitarian Society, and then a little later, a, a chorus at the uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, and both of them have decided to give half of the proceeds to Manor. Wow. Good things are happening. Wow. So we, we don't have to only come to you. Yeah. 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 So, and what other sources do you have for food besides uh, the food bank? Obviously, the food bank is the primary source. Yeah. But uh, Big Y, Stop and Shop, River Valley, Starbucks, and Hampshire College. And Stop and Shop and, and uh, Big Y are the bakery products. Uh, River Valley is produce. Starbucks is... The you know what You know what they have? Yeah. No, no, not the coffee, but all the goodies that they the sell coffee. for about three or four dollars a piece. Right. They no. give us trays of... Really? I, I love it. Of course, it really tempts people like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no. And uh, just yeah. uh, one more thing. The uh, <clears throat> Hampshire College provides us leftover from the meals they serve the students. And I can tell you, the students eat well over there. And we get some great entrees. And sometimes it, for a, a meal, we'll have, without exaggerating, eight or ten entrees. You know. and they freeze them in every two weeks to, to deliver us a batch of and you don't get it from Amherst College either because they have excellent food. Yeah. You know, we, don't, we haven't found another college to do it. And now I've learned that most of the colleges are really tightening up their food programs mm -hmm. to minimize the waste and minimize the uh -huh. expense. So it's probably all going to go away. Leftovers for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a college somewhere nearby? Yes. Pretty close to where you're located. Yeah, right, right. Very yeah. close, right next yeah. to uh, New, has new president ready? coming, maybe. Oh, uh, that might change something. Might be a little deal with the new president. Do you do you find do you see the same faces? Oh, well, that's interesting too. Uh, we about a third of our guests are a core group that come almost every meal, and then the rest of them, I can't believe that 
turnover in the course of a year. And there must be a lot of people passing through Northampton or something. And then we're getting a lot of uh, young people who are hanging out downtown, you know, like to get a free meal, which is fine. And I don't think they're homeless, but they would prefer to stay downtown rather than go home. Mm -hmm. And they're probably not in school and probably not working, which is unfortunate. And of course, Bob and Louis, they're, they're big advocates of yours. They're, uh, um, they're pretty conservative, too, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They think that the, you get, the whole program gets rave reviews from everywhere I go. That's wonderful. I'm glad to hear yeah. that. And uh, it's just, it's, it's a fantastic operation. Thank you. I just you. can't imagine it's gone that many years. Some yeah. of that stuff just seems to start off and then it just withers up and it goes away. And it's, I can't believe the lasting power of this program. Yeah. It's, un, it's unfortunate that it'll be needed forever I to make things so. are going, but uh, yeah. I've always felt that people shouldn't have to go hungry or shouldn't have to live out on the street when they're working, dealing with their other problems. Now, is it the same amount of meals every year, pretty much? Uh, well, let's see, about, you know, four, four and three years ago, it, it incre increased each year because of the recession, I'm sure. Yeah. The last two years, it's leveled up. Yeah. Well, Carl, I think you do a great job. Well, I'm thanks. curious yes. about your board. You mentioned one person who does a lot of fundraising. Yeah. Can you tell us more about who helps out on your board? Ten people's a good size board. Yeah, it is. Lucky. Because they want to join us. Yeah. Uh, let me just check my list. Of, I don't have a minute to remember. Did I put a list of board members in here? <laughs> is that one of the requirements? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. not one of the requirements. Oh, then I probably didn't do it. I should have brought my own list. But uh, it's a wonderful mix of uh, intelligent, capable people, young, old, men, women, and uh, they're, they're mostly uh, active people in the community or in different organizations in the community or in religious organizations and uh, they uh, they really get into it if you know what I mean and, and they come up with great ideas and, you know, I, I, I head the program but all, all the work is underneath me and I, I, it's, it's just wonderful you know? well you probably know from your professions that people you hire or the people that volunteer for you make the, all the difference I wanted to ask you about that liability insurance. Yeah. Now, I think I had read where some of the board of directors also are involved in the liability yeah, insurance. A, we have liability insurance for the program in case, well, honestly, a guest sues us. It's never happened. And then uh, it's a requirement for right. some level. It's the, to to become chartered, you have to have your board indemnified. Yeah, we're incorporated, and we had to have liability insurance on the boards. Again, I suppose, so if anybody... If anybody it, sues yeah. the program, they, they can attach the assets of the board to our exactly. the, the idea was not to discourage people from joining boards and putting themselves at risk. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for a suit, you know, if, if, if you're on a board and people sue towards the deepest pockets. So if, yeah. you, if you have a wealthy board member, for instance, working in development, you don't want to you want that person to feel comfortable to be able to come and serve on that board. So every board, I believe, is required by Massachusetts Charter for 501 C threes. You have to have you have to be indemnify the board so that they're covered in the event that something like that happens. Let me just mention one name on the board who's the, really got a fundraising going. Larry uh, Fields, who's a, a local physician, I'm not sure where his office is. Is the name ring a bell? Uh, he does. Yes, he yeah. does. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, are you still doing the sign up, the sign in sheet, or? Uh, I know a lot of people don't want to sign it. Yeah, well, we we have, we have a volunteer at, at the sign in table, and we do not firmly but nicely request that every guest 
sign in some way. It doesn't have to be their own name. It doesn't have to be a name. Or, oh. <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have Mickey Mouse eating with you? No, but, no it's important to know the number of guests, again, yeah. again for the food banks. They like Yes. That was why I asked. Yeah. yeah. And uh, once in a while we uh, try to work this uh, profile screening uh, sheet that I included in the package for a few weeks just to get a feel for the makeup of the, the guests of the server. Never any rockets, is there? No, it's amazing. I know. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's because they want to behave. They're eating. As I probably said before, they they know they're in a church and they have some respect yes. for a church, even if they're not religious. I, yeah. I, I love the way that they probably have respect for what is being given to them and yeah. the people serving them. Yeah. So your meal tomorrow was at six. Yeah. And you know, basically, uh, we don't do any screening. Anybody who wants to eat the meal can have get yeah. one. But we can't be there. We'll be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, so. You can bring us the over. Yeah, we we do take out. <laughs> but but uh, um, what was I going to say? Oh, you know, as with the shelter, if somebody is excessively under the influence of something, you really can't have them come in because it disrupts the. The whole atmosphere. And on rare, rare occasions, like at the shelter the other night, unfortunately, we we do have to call the police, but they're very nice. And they know how to handle situations like that. And, and they try not to be offensive to the disruptive guest. And it's usually a young man. The police force has a lot of young men. It's a lot of returning veterans, actually. Is that too, that too? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, with a new police station, new cars, they want to come And they have new cars, too, I guess. Well, Carl, we want to thank you very, very much. And we want, would like you to go back and tell all your volunteers and your chef and them, thank you. Yeah. No, I love hearing it. Thanks a lot. And it, it, I'll pass it on to them because they're the ones doing it. And, you know, I thought you might ask if I had any questions. And can I just ask a question that popped into my mind? Uh, I'm sure CDBG funds are dwindling like all federal yeah, and state yeah. funds. I was just curious, uh, are you taking uh, first-time applicants or just repeat, we repeat applicants? We don't have any first-time applicants. This time. Those, uh, but would you take them? Mm -hmm. Every, um, everyone is welcome to apply. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Do you have a program in mind? No, no, I'm just thinking, even though the funds are dwindling. Yeah, the funds actually, yeah, I'll give you the... Quick breakdown: We have one hundred sixty-one thousand dollars in requests, uh, seventy-nine thousand dollars basically oh, no. to give out, which is down from eighty-eight thousand last year. Yeah. And it doesn't even take into possibly it doesn't take into account the sequestration cuts in oh, yeah. income. So, and on one hand, it's we're somewhat relieved that we don't have new applicants because we don't have to we don't have to spread it as yeah. even thinner. And but the, on the other hand, knowing that that's the reason we know I new, have new applicants is not because there's, the need's not out there, it's just that people don't necessarily feel hardened enough to try and ask for the small amount that ultimately that we're able to give out. So I, th I think that might. Quick to day two, engine three, respond mutually to the town of West Sorry, Hampton, 371 <laughs> Main Road. You're, you're cruising <laughs> where? <laughs> So, come on now, Carol, who is it that you're thinking about? What's that? Who is it that you're thinking about for the first time applicant? No, I, I, honestly, <laughs> honestly. I was just wondering if the smaller pie has to be divided into no, more yeah, pieces. No, yeah, it's about, fortunately, not, it's still just a smaller pie, but we don't have to divvy up even smaller pieces. We actually had $285,000 worth of requests last year. Wow. With, so we have $100,000 less worth of requests this year and ten thousand dollars less to give out. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. Before Carl goes, I just want to mention that he and I hang out together on the COT management committee and have for years. And twice a week Carl gets up at probably 
4 or 5 a.m. No, that's not exactly. 5.30. Oh, my God. She leaps over to the cot shelter and picks up all the laundry and takes it over to the jail and then re-delivers it back to the cot shelter from the jail. So this is his unsung hero task for God knows how many years. And Carl is just, he does overnights. He He's on the on-call list if wow. an overnight person cancels. <laughs> Carl makes himself available. So he's definitely committed to the population and there's many more things that he does that we will never know. So I'm taking this opportunity to share at least some of his secrets. I'm so happy you did. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, I did hear that, as you're saying, you and Carl hang out on the cot. Uh, that's all you heard. That's all I heard. <laughs> I I on the shelter. Cot Management Before. Committee is what I said. We're being recorded. Overnight volunteers <laughs> do all sleep on the same so, food so time in their uh, volunteer room. Uh, so Not at the same time. As you manage, and, uh, for your hobby, Huh. then you continue your largesse and your kindness and your your grace by serving in any number of other capacities. That yeah, I'm a compulsive volunteer. And Is I'm, that it? And I'm retired, mm -hmm. and I don't play golf. I do get all the I, other things that retired men do. I, you know, I, uh, how amazing that would be if other people were similarly afflicted. Well, there are, are quite a few out here. But, uh, okay, well, yeah, there are. You're right. Actually, we do have a, a pretty good inventory of volunteers in the but I, I, I think that you kind of set the bar pretty high. No, the chemistry of the Northampton community is amazing. It's, it's a wonderful model of how to live together. And uh, I grew up in the Boston area, which is different, nice, but different. You know? Since we came out here in 76, we, we, did, we knew nothing about Northampton, now we love it. <laughs> and I don't want to turn this into a love fest, but <laughs> I, I know that all of you people do wonderful work too and have done for years and, and we, we, we know this out there but if it's something like that we know this <laughs> <laughs> thank you have a good battery in there for right. yeah. <laughs> we just lost it with the reach the cassette <laughs> yeah. that's another good thing about Northampton it has a great respect yeah. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you, thank you very much Where's the door? I gotta get Over here. Yeah, where's the door? We're hermetically sealed. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. There's a song about that. Stay dry. Or, or get, get dry. Right. Go yes. get dry. Yeah, right. That's right. Hey, Maris, come on in. Mass Ooh, Fair Housing right. Center. Mm. Fair Housing Program. Yeah. We do have a brand new project. Just that one. That's just that one. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. Yeah. Um, I only got into this. That was, that was the that was what Les was said about Friday. Oh, okay. All right. He's coming in. Hi. Hello. Good evening. Hello. I think there's a, I think there's a doorbell. There is a there. It says in case of emergency. It was locked when I got here. Do you think though because if there's a fire? But I'm the last the person. Oh, you know what? That that may happen. That when they all when they vacate. No, there has to be someone in the building. In the oh yeah. Duty. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it did say in case of emergency, push the button for the dispatcher. So I was evaluating. Yeah. <laughs> it was the dispatcher. Emergency. That means they would tone it in here to yeah, say that someone's at the door. No, right. they would just, they're right at the top of the stairs. So they would just wing the door open and look down and probably run out. There's more than one dispatcher up there. And I know that because I just finished the Citizens Police Academy that's for eight weeks. So. You mentioned that one. We had a tour of the dispatch. So. Well, I'm glad you didn't get waterlogged while you were waiting for somebody <laughs> that had the takeout food it's to get in. Soggy, but <laughs> okay. Welcome, and could you just give your name, please? Of course. Um, my name is Maris Berquist, and I'm the executive director of the Massachusetts Fair Housing Center. This I is my. To let you know, also, Meredith, that this whole meeting is being recorded and videoed. Oh, okay. Just so that you know that. Well, and you do know Peg Keller, right? I do. Okay. And to my right is Carol Reinhardt yes. from the Human Rights Commission. She's chair. And um, <coughs> to my left is City Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward right. 7. And Bill Dwight, our I'm Councilor sure. at Large, Council President. And Mary Labarge, oh. City Councilor from Ward 6. And the Chair of Social Services and Veterans Affairs. So... Um, we're going to talk about your program. 
and because we do know about your program, because they come every year, what I'd like for you to do there with this, if you could possibly talk about the success that you're having with this program, and also, is there any kind of problems or concerns that we should know? Um, I'd be happy to. Um, the thing that jumps to my mind immediately in terms of the success of our program overall, our program um, was established in 1989, so we're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary in two, 2014. 2014. Um, so that's a long time, I think, for a small agency like ours to be in existence, and we cover five counties in western and central Massachusetts providing what we call full fair housing services. So that includes um, really extensive education and outreach to the community and to the housing industry. We've had a long-standing relationship with the city of Northampton, and I think actually have celebrated a recent success in terms of our, um, we wrote, we, we did a lot of research and writing to come up with the current analysis of impediments to fair housing in Northampton. Um, this is a document that has to be uh, created, it has to be written in order for a municipality to qualify for community development block grant funding. Um, we're very proud of the, the document that we did come up with, which identified some significant impairments to fair housing within Northampton. Um, so that's both, I guess, a success and um, concern. Are you going to let us know what those are, actually, for the Yes, I, well, I'll probably just address the short list, you know, oh, the, the major yeah, concerns. Yeah, it, it's a major concern. The major concerns are, I would say, at this point in time, um, problem with the presence of lead in the older housing stock in Northampton. So we identified, I think, 50% of the housing stock in Northampton probably has lead paint in it. And what that means in terms of fair housing is that it makes it very difficult for families with children under the age of six to access rental housing because Massachusetts has one of the oldest and strongest lead paint laws on the books, um, which requires anyone who rents or actually, I, I really think any family with a child under the age of six in um, a housing unit where there's lead paint must abate the lead in the unit. So there's a lot of worry and fear and anxiety about the cost of deleading. Um, and what that the end result the net result for families seeking housing is that these homes are pretty much off limits to them because mm -hmm. landlords don't want to um, incur the expense of abatement or the liability I think in some cases of lead poisoning. So that was a significant impediment to fair housing that was found. Um, another impediment is the um, lack of education at this point for people in the housing industry and indeed for community groups to understand recent changes in the law which is, have expanded protections for um, people uh, well, under the category of gender identity and expression. So you may have read in the paper um, that the legislature added as a protected category within the state gender identity and expression. So we would really need to educate landlords about this fact. And what we had proposed in the analysis of impediments is working with an L, uh, LGBT group in order to you know, maybe come up with some kind of joint presentation on that. Um, they're also re very recent. Actually, I don't think they're April 3rd. It will go into effect a new law which expands um, housing rights for victims of domestic violence. This is very new. It's, it's a really, you know, it's a step in the right direction by the state to allow women, uh, it's usually women, but this law protects um, gay couples as well, which has kind of been neglected in this whole field of domestic violence. But this um, hasn't happened yet, has it? April. April 3rd. April 3rd it will go into effect. It's been passed, but there's an effective date of April 3rd. Okay. And, and um, locks will be changed uh, for a nominal fee for a victim. A victim can terminate his or her lease. Um, within, I believe, three months of an incident of domestic violence. So it's doing outreach, it's educating people because people who don't know their people who don't know their rights can't, uh, you know, assert them, and landlords who don't know 
their responsibilities can't follow them. So it's re really important that we get the word out. We're, you know, we're in business to do that. We have the expertise to do that. We have the connections to do that. Um, the third area, the, the area I think where we log in the most complaints of housing discrimination in Northampton is for people with disabilities. So very, you know, higher rates of housing discrimination within Northampton for people with disabilities. So that's also going to necessitate more education and outreach on that front because there are a lot of myths. Um, I have a current case right now with a, um, a man in, in Northampton who faced you know, pretty cruel housing discrimination because of his mental illness. Mm -hmm. He's um, he's a good tenant. He's um, got his rent um, guaranteed by a mental health agency within the state, and probably because of that, he was turned down for housing. You know, very very cruelly and very unfairly. So that's um, you know, unfortunately, still housing discrimination. Unfortunately, is still happening. Um, and you know, we you know it. We need to address it. It's just, it's un-American. Um, yeah, just the, the notion that a housing market would be weighted so heavily against people in protected categories is wrong in this day and age. And we're actually celebrating the 45th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act on April 11th. We have a big conference planned in Springfield. Um, I can send you all an email invitation to that conference. Thank you. It's a two-day conference. We're very excited about it. Um, there was just one other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, the Cory workshop. The Cory. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we um, have developed the expertise also to go out and talk to groups about their rights under the new Cory reform. And that actually became effective in May of last year, May 2012. And we find that because of racial profiling throughout the criminal justice system, um, a disproportionate number of people who are black and Latino have been profiled and just interacted with the criminal justice system as, at a much higher rate than, um, than other groups. And because of that, if a landlord has a, a policy of not running to someone with any criminal history, we had a case involving a young man with an arrest record. Um, he was a Latino from Springfield. He had an arrest record. It was four years old, and he was denied housing because of that, simply because of that arrest record. So that's an unfair penalty that that it is you know, weighs heavily, you know, against traditional minority communities. So we're going to be doing a training um, under our existing CDBG funding from Northampton um, very soon, and um, want to continue doing that work, as well as reaching out to the Human Rights Commission to see if we can also maybe streamline and sh you know share information in a way that we haven't done in the past. That's good. Um, uh, something we've been doing for everyone there is, is giving the, the, the breakdown on, on the block grant allocations for this year. Last, uh, we have $161,000 worth of requests and $79,000 to distribute and um, with possible even further cuts of that because um, it may not factor in sequestration right. cuts. Um, and in fact, that's down from $88,000 last year. The, and the thing that, that I think it's important to emphasize is that our award, while may be just level funded or even underfunded from the previous year, is not a, re a reflection of our, our esteem for the program. And 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 our on our understanding of how badly it's needed. In fact, it, it informs pretty much a lot of our frustration as we deliberate these things. That um, we find, but, you know, I, I actually it's it's the rare applicant we've ever had that that we don't recognize that they have uh, they provide for critical needs in the community, and it, it's it's very frustrating in the fact that what we're offering is pretty paltry. You, but knowing that, that a lot of uh, block grant assignments go towards leveraging other monies and other, other uh, and grant appeals and things like that, anything that we can do to assist in that, to reinforce not only what we're, what we're going to offer as an award, but somehow reinforce either through testimony or through a letter or something like that, might, if, if that is considered helpful, um, 
I, I, I'm not speaking for all of us here, but I, I, certainly in my case, I'd be glad to, oh, thank you very to, much. to offer some form of uh, testimony that was certain. So, thank you. Yeah. I'll, you I'll also add that the impediments analysis is a planning document, so we were able to take excess CDBG planning and administration funds that were left over from the vacancy of Terry Anderson. There right. was a few months right. where we didn't have yeah. a position in there. So it was $6,000 that we applied to the, what's called the AI, the analysis of impediments. And then we've thought that in the future, our plan is to get a fuller, more comprehensive document and go to the Community Preservation Committee right. for that yeah. because yeah. it is a it's, an activity that's, that's in support of community housing. Yeah. So the complaint processing, the education and outreach, the things that they do with the 2500 aren't eligible for those kinds of things. But we're trying to just kind of bring in other resources to really get full utilization of their expertise and, and carry out other activities in the community. So. The uh, <coughs> fellow that was denied housing because of the arrest record, was Latino. Yes. And do you suppose it was because he was Latino, maybe, that they... Well, what I can tell you is that... I'm trying to figure out this one case that you're talking about. Well, you're, you're on videotape, and it's really not great to talk okay. about specific cases. Yeah, so just well, I wasn't asking for any names yourself, or anything. Yeah. Um, well, well I, I just would like to point out that um, the EEOC, which is the federal agency that enforces the employment discrimination laws, has basically issued guidance to, um, to employers stating that um, any employer who uses criminal history to basically deny employment to someone who is black or Latino is, is probably utilizing a policy that has a disparate impact on those groups and could be illegal, you know. It, it's suspicious. Yeah. What has that same standard been applied to housing? Is it? Is there? You know, there's no reason not to apply it to housing, and and that and that's a nationwide guidance. So yeah. a lot of the statistical analysis that you do um, to analyze that kind of claim in a housing context um, is is usually local. So it's kind of interesting, at the very least, that the federal government in April of last year issued this guidance and it, it could be translated to housing, I think. It's, it's the impetus for court reform, the, the fact that criminal background checks are now being utilized for any number of reasons to discriminate for, for employment or, or for housing or for anything else, actually. Right. Um, and it, it, including receiving benefits and aid. And that once upon a, I, theoretically, when Corey was established, it was basically to protect people from teaching, for instance, who might not be qualified for it based on some of it. But now it's so broad and so indiscriminate, oddly enough, that it actually has a profound impact on whole sections of people, any, any number of us who might have been, who, who might have had, who might be subject to a court review. Mm -hmm. It is the permanent Staying of the of the court review that literally keeps you down, puts you in a situation where you don't have, where you miss opportunity that you should be entitled to. So, and and the reform that we got was paltry, given what is needed. In my opinion, yeah. I think I think the court reform has to be top to bottom and has to be a lot stricter. Than it is now. The it workshop is March twenty sixth at ten a.m. Second floor City Hall. If you care to join in. What is it? Corey workshop, Reform Workshop, oh. March 26th at 10. So, um, on the AI... 10 o'clock in the morning. The, is, 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 is there any... Is this published? Is the information published? In it's the, not on the it? web. Um, I, mean, I need to the, get it on... I just wrote myself a note to get it on the web. Right, I mean, the newspaper, it seems to me... If it, if it leads with landlords, um, you know, something with landlord in the in the in the headline, it's likely that, that that a property owner landlord would probably see the article and see that these are 
these are the pressure points here in Northampton. These are uh, we can't put stuff in the paper. It's just that I'm saying that I think the paper might be interested in this as an uh, But this is statewide, right? Well, what, what, you, what Maris is talking about is actually stuff that's specific to Northampton. But the, I understand the, that. But this law is statewide. Oh, the Corey law. The yes. Corey law. Yes. But I, I, I'm talking about. The, I think the, I think you should take a look at it and then see that our our public distribution of it and how it gets out there yeah. is something that we need to craft. We need to work on. Yes. I mean, I, I think it's to the education point that you were referring, educating landlords and property owners, um, uh, that for some landlords, I've I've dealt in two personal situations who have law, who have not been able to get an apartment because of the lead paint issue. Uh, because they had, in both cases, single mothers with children who were desperate need of housing. One was actually already in the apartment, was evicted because of the presence of lead paint. Mm -hmm. no this, is, this was two years ago, and I referred her, <laughs> referred her to a number of agencies, but I don't know if she ever, she just gave up. She moved out of town. But um, Well, the workshops on targeted topics we would certainly want the help of the Gazette, but just to kind of throw the report out there, without willy nilly, yeah, we just it's kind of kind of like a first cut. So mm -hmm. we need we, and there's a lot of things we need to work on, and exactly what some of the recommendations are, we're doing the Corey Reform Workshop, and then we're going to do the one on the the gender rights, and then definitely the disabilities one that I'm going to. Yeah. We're going to coordinate with probably the Human Rights Commission and then the Committee on Disabilities. So we are starting to implement some of the recommend recommendations, but um, and we definitely do want to get a more comprehensive document out there. But I do want to put it on the web, and if you guys want to see it, I would love for you to see it. But there's just kind of a lot of things that do need context. So that's March 26th on the Cory at 10 o'clock where? 10 to noon, second floor of City Hall in the hearing room. And your invitation list or your outreach list for that workshop, how are you recruiting participants? Oh, I don't really want to. Well, a, uh, <laughs> Whitney Abel, who works with her, has, she's the education and outreach person, so she has probably 30 or 40 folks, and then she sent it to me, and then I sent it to my so 30 or 40 all folks. The, and all the uh, building owners and landlords? It's more and service providers and housing providers. I don't know that the... I'm, I, I'm trying, I'm blanking on her private landlord outreach. There's no landlord association in Northampton. Um, but you're raising a good point about the just, you know, the generic private landlord community. I'll have to check with Whitney to see what her thoughts are on that. There is a, not a, a secret landlord association within Northampton. We know that. <laughs> Mary's sure. bird question: What nationality is that name? <laughs> um, my last name is Swedish. Okay. I would have guessed that, but there, there are a lot of them. <laughs> As I usually. Oh, you doing that. Meredith, we want to thank you very much. Oh, thank here. you. Thank you for your interest and for your support through the years. We we really do. We operate on a shoestring, low overhead in Holyoke for the last 25 years. We're all very dedicated. I think Peg knows that to what we do. And um, What is your address? I told Holyoke? her she needs to go to other towns and get CDBG money. So she's put right. some other applications in other people's hoppers, so yeah. this is a statutory requirement that not every municipality adheres to, so they really don't have a choice to say no, and yeah. a lot of them are, so. Do you go to Amherst by any chance? <laughs> I haven't gone to him. I'm, I'm thinking seriously about going to Amherst. Um, we understand their, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, they're uh, never specialized in their awards, uh, <clears throat> but it'll be interesting. Amherst is an interesting place, I think. I have cards if you would like. Like one place. Thank you, Mary. So I put a pair of glasses hung up on my 
watched it, and they turned out when I got to 18. They're my wife's. So, oh. they're, they're my wife. <laughs> so I had to walk down to CBS and buy this pair of glasses so I could see tonight. <laughs>